It's California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are in Sacramento, the state's capital. We are joined by Christina Garcia, a member of the California State Assembly and the new assistant whip Thank for you. the body. Congratulations. You must be so pleased and proud. What does it mean to be the assistant whip? Well, first of all, it is definitely a privilege and an honor to be part of this. It means that I'm part of leadership. Right. And so I get to sit on the cabinet for the speaker who runs our house uh, and have a little more input directly to, to what's going on in the party's uh, priorities. It also means that I run around the floor to make sure that members are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So that's <laughs> And you are a teacher, right? <laughs> yes. So it's perfect. Uh, and following the rules right. and, you know, and trying to make sure we are doing are conducting our business as uh, effectively and efficiently as possible. Since I've known you, we've been speaking about your desire to see more women elected to office, more women in leadership. I'm looking at the assembly right now, and I noticed that the Speaker of the Assembly, which is the head of the Democratic Party, a woman, Tony Atkins, the Republican leader of the Assembly, Connie Conway, a woman. Right. Not bad. Well, actually, this is the first time either house has two women leading right. the party at the same time. So it's definitely historic. Uh, it's important. I think it lets us, lets us know that women can be leaders. It's an example to individuals like myself or other folks out there saying that we can be. But at the same time, I think we, it shouldn't be lost on us that uh, women are only 25% yes. of the state legislature. But more alarming is that next year with term limits and with the uh, slate of candidates we have right now, we're going to be losing women. And so oh, we're, really? I think, best case scenario, only going to have 20%. So I think we need to celebrate this historic moment. I'm, I'm very proud to say I'm part of this moment, and right. I fought hard to make sure we had these women in leadership. But I think we need to take their leadership now and the fact that they're at the helm and have a real commitment to turning things around for the rest of us. I have to ask you, and some may call it impolitic, but let me go there. Having two women at the helm, do you think that changes the tone, the tenor, of the body? Well, I mean, I, I think ultimately we have people, individuals, we thought we're going to move the, the house forward, we're going to move the party forward. And so, uh, I mean, I think I personally, yeah, I am a little biased. I think women <laughs> uh, do it differently and sometimes do it better. Uh, with that said, though, I still believe that the men deserve half of the pie. And so, sure. uh, you know, uh, but I am excited. I do think that it's an opportunity to see what two women can do. And these two women in particular are pretty pragmatic. We're across the aisle. And, and they're I think, funny and a hoot and well, friendly and, and gregarious. To me, more importantly, try to be fair, mm. uh, which is something that I really appreciate and play less of the games and just get the business done, which maybe is unique to women. Like, let's just get it done. Since I've known you, you've also been beating the drum about ethics and ethics reform. And this is before three members of the California State Senate were either convicted or indicted. You've been speaking about this. We now see the Senate clamoring to show that they are on the front page with ethics reform. What's your sense of the mood surrounding the topic generally? Well, I think this crisis has created an opportunity where we're at least talking about it. We're accepting that, you know, we're not all bad. We shouldn't be all painted with the same mm -hmm. paintbrush, but we could be professionals. We could hold each other accountable, and we need to make change. And so I think both houses are saying, hey, the Senate's doing something, we're doing something, we'll find that compromise together. That something needs to take place. I think for a long time, no one wanted to even discuss the issue with me because they were afraid that by discussing it, we were implying that we were guilty versus, hey, I, I believe a lot of us are doing it well, actually. Right. But there's some loopholes out there that we need to fix. There's a culture that we need to address because the times have changed. I think most impo importantly, public expectation evolves. And so we need to update our roles to, to match that evolution of public expectation. But what's frustrating for some is to win a seat in the California legislature, it can cost a million dollars. That's a lot of money. You know, for yeah. a job that pays under 100000 you get more with per diems and no pension. Yeah, don't tell my mom that. She <laughs> reminds me every time she sees me about that. What I want to do when we come back, Assemblywoman, is talk more about specifics for the ethics reform debate because I do think you'll have some interesting insight. For our viewers on HLN, we thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So, Assemblywoman, I want to speak about some of the political reforms that we have heard proposed by you and others. I know that you have been a big proponent of preventing lobbyists from hosting events at their homes. Intuitively, I guess that doesn't feel right. But then again, a home's just a home, so why should it matter where it is? 
I think we've heard a lot in the public discussion, not just currently, but for, for the last few years, about undue influence by special interests. And so, yeah, you know, it's it's the relationship of, as a member, I could have an open door with constituents, with special interests. I mean, right. at the end of the day, they're also constituents here, and they sure. have businesses in the state. But I think at the end of the day, and it's not, I mean, what was happening before is that we had a loophole, an exemption. Lobbyists could host a fundraiser at their house, spend $500, and not have to report any of it. I see. Versus they can only spend $10 when we go out to coffee. That's it, a month on me. So there's a discrepancy there. And so if we've decided that, hey, we need to limit what you can spend on me without reporting it or without your client paying for it, then the same thing should apply in your household. So your, so your bill would allow the fundraisers to continue at their homes, but just report the it, donation. It brings sunshine and not, not just report it, but the, it would then be a campaign contribution, which is under the same contribution limits. Uh, and it would be reportable in the same fashion that, say, a fundraiser at our restaurant is. There have also been moves to limit or eliminate fundraising during certain time periods. Senator Padilla talks about eliminating fundraising in the last three months of the session. Uh, candidate for Secretary of State Dan Schnur, while the legislature is in session. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you got to raise a lot of money to run for office. Does it really matter when you raise the money? I mean, if someone's going to exert influence on you, properly or improperly, they're going to do it no matter when the check is given, no? Well, I will say this. Uh, the better relationship we have with your community, the less money you have to raise. It well stated. It goes back to the fact that we need to start to demand that we have constituents that are closely connected to their community. It doesn't mean we don't need money. Uh, when we do the fundraising, I think it's, it's a matter of what the public is thinking and when is the undue influence. There's a criticism that you move the deadline and fine, so we're just going to collect the checks two weeks later or a month later, and it's not really going to change the influence that's there and what we take into consideration. Uh, at the end of the day, we are still worried about uh, the money and the undue influence. Really, then, the, the voters need to agree to public financing. And I know that's a big, <laughs> scary topic in my house and, and in, up here in the legislature. And I'm not carrying legislation, I think. But I think at the end of the day, if those constituents want to criticize us for having those relationships with fundraisers, with lobbyists, then they need to say, okay, the way to eliminate it is public financing. But unless the public's willing to have that there, they also have to give us some flexibility here. But the challenge becomes, as you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has come out with a series of decisions, two in the last five mm -hmm. years, which really blow the barn door open in terms of the amount of money that can be given by a specific individual or group of individuals or organization. Well, so we have to be careful. To an individual candidate, it doesn't necessarily change that. It's how That's much true. I give to the collective candidate, to the uh, bodies. But what's more important is that now with Citizens United, what's happened here is that you can spend an unlimited amount of money, collect an unlimited amount from a single donor to do independent expenditures, which are really campaigns for, I guess, a candidate that are not in co coordination directly with the candidate. Uh, but how that's coordinated or not, I mean, we don't know. But really, the reality is that it's not always money that goes directly to the candidate, but that it's is, these but other committees that we need to start looking at also. I do believe that my package is the beginning of a discussion, but it's not going to fix everything. And we need to start pushing the envelope into reeling in, and reeling in but, these but here's, committees. But here's the thing. I know how hard it is to get elected to office. I watch how hard you all work. You specifically, for example, you represent close to 500,000 people. Okay. It's hard to reach 500,000 people. A state senator, a million people in their district, bigger than some states. Okay. You got to get to them somehow. And while it's so frustrating to see how money can corrupt, how else are you going to do it? I, I just don't know. And, and I'm not I don't, saying, I, don't get me yeah. wrong, I mean, I don't want to be hypocritical. I fundraise right. money, uh, right. you know, so I'm not going to I'm not gonna hide that. But you know what? I'm honest about it. And it's all, this, it's right. all out there. It's sunshine is it's what sunshine. you're looking for. It's sunshine. And at the end of the day, I really feel it's the relationship between the constituents and me. And if they're having a real issue, they're going to go say, you know what? I don't trust you anymore. I'm going to vote you out no matter how much money I have. But as long as I put it out there, at the end of the day, as long as there is information, some voters are going to say, you know what? We're happy. We don't really care. Uh, but we have to put it out there. Why are we hiding it? What are we so afraid of? So and it's not just con contribution limits, but also we should be putting out there what we're paying our elected officials, right? How I spend my budget, what I earn, any, any additional per diems or reimbursements, mm -hmm. even the name of my staff, that all of that's online. Why shouldn't all elected officials across the board at a local level and a state level have that information available? We should know total compensation, not just your salary. Her name is Christina Garcia. She is the new assistant whip for the California State Assembly. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's California Edition.